There are three things you can do to help us out. One, you can make sure you subscribe to this channel. Two, is you can leave a comment here or on Apple Podcasts. And three, if you really want to help, you can follow this link to see how you could be a supporter on Patreon. Word in your attic, a Zoom with a view. Well, welcome to another Word in Your Attic. And I'm delighted to say that we're, re we're reaching out further probably than we've ever been in this in this series over the last over the last two years, all the way to Australia to speak to, to uh, the, the ambassador for Watford in, the, uh, in, in Sydney, <laughs> Australia, and, uh, and doyen of the record pluggers, old mate of ours, Malcolm Hill. Malcolm, how are you doing? Nice Obviously, to see you. Yeah. Lovely to see you guys. It's a privilege to be uh, to be invited on the show. And it's very it's obviously you. it's obviously very early in the morning with you. It's it's what time? It, it's uh, it says on my uh, watch here that it's seven o three a.m. Never so too early good. for an old grey whistle test T-shirt. We know because no, <laughs> I was going to start not? by saying I think <laughs> I think we we probably first met probably forty years ago this yeah. year. And I think I might even know the circumstances of the three of us first meeting. I think it would have been a whistle test in Manchester. Oh, yeah. Kate Bush. Did you not come up to Manchester bringing Kate Bush? I did. Oh, God, uh, on the train. Tell us a story about You brought her on a train. Which, oh, you've got to tell us a story. Didn't, wasn't she rehearsing the dance <laughs> God, moves? No, no, the, let come me, on. Let me tell the story. Go on. <laughs> yes, and I remember also we had another act on that show, the Sadistic Mika Band. Oh, wow. All oh, right. Yeah, so yeah, I remember it very, very well. No, yeah, it was. Yeah, Kate uh, was getting ready to tour uh, and didn't want to take the time to do the show. Not that, she, not that she didn't love the whistle test like we all did. Uh, <laughs> it's all right, you so, don't. Have to stop it. No, no, no. no you no. don't need to, don't worry. <laughs> so... Um, I came up with a plan. I talked to uh, British Rail and asked them to put an extra carriage on the train to Manchester. Um, I love that. It's Kate Bush, an extra carriage. No problem. <laughs> yeah. And, it, uh, and could it be a guards van uh, to give us plenty of room to, uh, uh, to practice and, and rehearse? And uh, thankfully, I must have spoken to somebody at British Rail who was a Kate Bush fan because it happened. And we oh, got no, there, we no. had our own carriage, and Kate rehearsed all the way up on the train to um, to Manchester. So you were uh, you the single member of her audience, basically? Was she prancing up and down a, a, a goods van? <laughs> is that how it worked? Not prancing up and down. No, okay, this is, whatever. This, this is art. Oh, okay, uh, all right. <laughs> Musical movement. Anyway, go on. Yeah. I think I don't think I was on my own. I'm pretty oh, right. sure there would have been somebody, but I can't remember. I remember sitting in, on the floor in the oh. guards van, watching her do it, cross and, and make, yeah, and making a few suggestions. I you know, bet. You, I yeah, bet. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Plie. Plie. Yeah. Can yeah, you yeah. do plie points? <laughs> Can you do ballet moves in a vehicle that's moving at I don't know 100 <laughs> miles an hour? It's well, so she, peculiar. To... Well, she did, and look, I, I just said. Can I kind of veer on to something else connected yeah. with that tour? Because I, I have a vivid memory. Kate put everything into what she, as we know, she, she's a perfectionist and she puts everything into everything that she does. And I can remember on the tour, which followed shortly after that, being at the Goldmont in Southampton, stood with her on the stage at Soundcheck and she had her ballet shoes on and there was blood coming yeah. through the shoes. And I just... I, I just said, look, look, there's a way to do this without injuring yourself. You know, you, you, you're trying too hard. And um, she said, bugger off, Malk, I've got a show tonight. Yeah, and, uh, <laughs> what a trooper. <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> and whatever I, happened to her, never heard of again. Yeah, <laughs> I know. Bless her. Bless her. She was, she was, a, she was an absolute gem. And uh, she even got to be a front cover on one of the magazines. Oh, there you she go. She did. There you oh, go. She and did. It sold extremely well. Let me well, well look, Malcolm, the way you traditionally start these chats is by asking people if they can remember what record playing machinery was in their house when they were a child. Can you remember that? Yes, I can. It's a big wooden radiogram, of course. Right. Of which course. are probably back in fashion now. <laughs> and uh, and it was, I because the first record, I think my mother must have bought it for me, but the first record I had was Max Bygraves. Oh, I'm, a, 
I'm a pink toothbrush, toothbrush. you're a blue, blue toothbrush. <laughs> um, I remember playing it on the seven, it was a 78. Believe oh, wow. it or not, I am oh, that old. Goodness. It was a seven, and I, I remember playing it on the machine. It was a big, um, like a, it, it looked like a washing machine, yeah, yeah. but it, yeah, made of wood, made of wood. Uh, didn't have a horn on it. I'm, you know, I probably that was a, it, it was an upgrade we had, but yeah, that, that was it. And we didn't have that for long because I got the sort of bug for, for music fairly early on. That would have been, I suppose, about eight years of age then. And, and we moved on fairly quickly to a reasonable, uh, reasonable record player. I so, where, where were you growing up? A place called Duckingfield. Uh, which is seven miles southeast of Manchester. Right, right. And don't tell me you've never heard of it. I have. I was just trying to place it. Yeah, uh, I've uh, never yeah. been there. Near Stanley Bridge. Okay, um, okay. Which, which, Can you uh, remember where you bought records? What was the nearest uh, Jones singles? Jones's record shop in Ashton under Line. Right. Um, yes, I do remember. It was next to the cinema. Yeah. Uh, and and if you walked down 200 meters the other way, my other passion at the time was model railways, and there was a nice model railway shop down there. But yeah, Jones in Ashton is where I, where I bought them, and because um, uh, my next record, very quickly after Max Bygraves, was a 45, oh. um, and I think my my ne- my neighbour, I think she was called Brenda, or the, the, the daughter of my neighbour, um, turned me on to Elvis, obviously. And it was um, Can't Help Falling in Love. But the B-side was Rockahoola Baby. Rockahoola yes. Baby. It, I was, it was on RCA, wasn't it? And, and yeah. co- Is that from Blue what? Hawaii? Is that from Blue Hawaii? I, I think? think it might be from Blue Hawaii. But, yeah, Rockahoola that, Baby was from Blue Hawaii, definitely. Yeah, yeah but that was uh, my uh, first 45. Oh, right. It's probably one of my first ones, actually, as well. Yeah. And and it and it took off from there. So you know, and now I've still got a lot of my stuff, and I bet I've still got that Rockahula baby. What have um, you got there? Have you got anything there you can show us? Have you got any of your old well, records there? Not well. I mean, a bit what you further got? on than that. Oh, I've got go. I've got a few things. Oh, here. go on, go on, go on. Because uh, that was very informative for me. Oh, that. <laughs> Pick me. oh my lord! <laughs> the fresh that- air. That was the harvest sampler. This yeah. is so funny. So that's like 1969 or something like that, Malcolm. Ooh, is is prob- that right? Probably, yeah. So yeah. who? Okay. What was the, who was on that again? Okay. Is, I, no, we're going to we're going to we're going to we're going to guess. We're going to have a game. Oh yeah, I'm guess. going to guess who was because I don't know. I can't remember. But were Pink Floyd on it in some shape or form? Surely, no. Uh, I no, don't think, they were. They, they were because they were on Harvest, weren't they? No, we, yeah, well, they, yeah, they were, were later. They moved them to Harvest. Yeah, um, but, uh, but, em- but em- embryo. Oh, the song, the track that's on oh right, okay. Yeah. Where was oh uh, god with a third year band on it? <laughs> yes, what what a great what great records they made. I love the third. <laughs> still play the third year band. Water was the track that's on Picnic. Very, very good. It, oh, it, it was lovely because this stuff just led me into so many other things. Right, right. Pretty things. The good Mister Square. Oh, yeah. is that is that from SF Sorrow? Or yeah, from, it is. It's no, it's from Parachute. It's from Parachute. Parachute, the one after. The one. Yeah. After. Yeah. Cool. It's See, funny. you know that. I don't know that. I haven't got that kind of memory. I don't. You know. I don't know <laughs> oh well, yeah. It's waking in a record shop. Did that for me. You, did, yeah, you never, so. never worked in record shop or anything like that, Malcolm? No, I never did. I worked in a, a, a for a tailor. Oh, um, really? Go on. Yeah, I worked at my from about the age of. I've been, I've been extraordinarily lucky in my life um, because people have, have have been nice to me and paid me well. Um, and I used to work for a guy called Mister Wood, who was a credit tailor. So basically, my job on a Saturday morning, and I would only be sixteen was to go around the local towns to where his um, his customers were and collect, collect. a pound. Or so something. he went with a little yeah. book. Yep, yeah, right. and did that. And it, bless him, I think he had a bit of a thing for my mum, um, which <laughs> which never materialised, but he was very kind to me. And I, I learned how to, I could do it, make, it, make you a suit when I was 16, really? uh, measure it and everything. Because uh, I used to work in a little bit of the shop. That was in Ashton under line. Uh, yeah, that was very, very... Uh, so and you're a debt collector, really. 
a debt collector. Uh, well, yeah. <laughs> but, hey, but he was hey, a tally well, man, wasn't he? A tally yeah. man. A tally man. But a very oh. smart debt collector. Yeah, yes. yeah, absolutely. Very well yeah. turned out. No, people did. I mean, people pre-credit cards. Nobody yeah, could afford right. to yeah. splash out on a thing like that. They had to, you know, get on tick in some on some never, shape never. or form, really, didn't they? Yeah. So, yeah. so when you when did you leave school? Uh, left school um, in uh, what would it be sixty six. So you were sixteen or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, sixteen. Right. I left school. I left school in the September. No, it must have been 67. I stayed on a year because I was thick. Um, <laughs> I, I was in five... Normally you stay on a year because you're really bright. <laughs> yeah, no, I stayed on a year because I was thick. <laughs> and uh, I, um, I, I, uh, I was in 5D. You couldn't get the law in D. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> <laughs> Doesn't sound and very elevated. <laughs> they, they, this... they didn't try to dress it up in those days, no, did they? No, not at all. <laughs> and I... I th- I don't think I'd, I think I maybe have got one O level, and my mum decided that I should stay on. So they elevated me to five B, uh, oh. just for the year. <laughs> uh, and it was a it was it was a grammar school, and I I hated it. I absolutely bloody hated it. It was horrible, um, except for the. Uh, the girl in the science, uh, who was the assistant to the teacher in the science class, she was gorgeous. Glenda Smith. I remember if you're watching, body. Glenda. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do you she want will to see be? the tattoo? <laughs> It'll get back to her. Uh, yeah. Glenda. <laughs> it's one of those days. Mark and I often talk about, you remember in the Likely Lads, they used to talk about uh, Deirdre Birchwood, who was the girl that yes. they'd always had a crush on. And there's yeah. just something about names like that. It's the name of the first everybody's girlfriend. Everybody's got a name always, of a first it girlfriend. It always is like that. It's really comical like somehow. That. Yeah. Good old Glenda. That's brilliant. <laughs> Let me add to that because my first girlfriend was called Donna Pragnall. There you, there you are. <laughs> it always works. It's a completely full. And here she is now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so how, how, did, how did you get involved with music professionally? Uh, DJ. Um, All right. I, okay. My my pals. My uh, I had. I, I, I'll try and. I had um, tried to be a guitarist. And my application, as it is still now, is rubbish. Um, so my dad, very quickly, my dad bought me uh, a Hofner guitar on the on the um, insistence that I take lessons. And he sent me to this really nice guy, um, a Romanian guy, who was teaching me Romanian folk songs. Well, this was 64, 65. <laughs> and of course, I wanted, here. <laughs> I wanted to be in the... <laughs> I wanted to be in the Beatles. So I was going to say the world's gone psychedelic, but you're doing Romanian folk songs. Yeah, good luck. So my dad, yeah, but I, I said to my dad, so "Look, Dad, I'm sorry, I can't, I, I can't continue with with this. I, um, I'll just teach myself." They said, "Well, you know what the deal was." I said, "Well, I'm sorry, I just can't do the Romanian folk song thing." And the day after, he sold my guitar. That's he gone. So my chance of being a musician went along with that. My it's pals. He had such a tough upbringing. It's like a Dickensian story. This is five D. Five D. Dad sold his guitar. guitar. <laughs> I was begging pound notes off people for the unpaid suits. Yeah, it's true. It's good. Oh, so you decided yeah. to be to be a DJ instead. Yeah, my my pals with they had a band which was originally called the Regents. Not the same regions, but then they moved on. In fact, I renamed them to a, a band called Schmo's Core, which I actually stole from another band in Stockport, I think. But they were very, very good, and we used to go as a road shop. I would, I would spin records, and the the band would play it. What kind of records were be- you playing? Oh, uh, it, it, it's it's um, Motown, right? Yeah, well, yeah. dance. Yeah dance stuff for the most part and yeah. uh, and uh, that what i liked and you know that's where my interest to find things came about so it was good to come up with that and then i moved on from that with that went for ages uh, i'd wanted to get in the music business never managed to i actually made it did a couple of radio uh, appearances um on radio manchester and i was I, I was keen to try bbc radio manchester i was keen to get into that i actually did dj'd at the cavern for uh, a while, the, the, the original cavern. Wow, that's um, brilliant! For a for a for a sh- not when the Beatles were there, obviously yeah. I would have been. Yeah. Uh, but around about sixteen, um, because uh, Bill Harry, I knew Bill Harry. Oh, who, right. oh we knew him. Of Mersey Beat yeah. fame. Yeah. Mersey Beat, yeah, yeah, I knew him, and ended up working with him at Rack. Um, 
but I did I, I did the uh, that and then we um, uh, what was I going to say? We did yeah. I, it went on for about four or five years, and I really enjoyed it. I had I was I was resident DJ at Berry Football Club, <laughs> and. And, and ground announcer for for a while at very oh see, see so you allow you you announce the the name of goal scorers and things like that yeah 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 that yeah. must be very exciting to do that doesn't Extra- it extraordinarily exciting but <laughs> you know, there, there may be more later on when we get down there but, <laughs> but no, it, it was no Barry was good I made my own lights. I had uh, disco lights, which I made myself. I made we my made own. our own lights yeah. in those days. Yeah, yeah. we did. <laughs> can- candles, it was. No, I made yeah. I made my own decks, uh, and but then that's when because uh, the Northern Soul thing started to come in. So I yeah. veered veered towards Northern Soul and ended up um, doing the downstairs um, hall uh, at Wigan Casino. Oh, really? the, the, the full-on um, Northern Soul thing was upstairs. I was downstairs where we had artists. Um, I remember Benny King came and, and, right. and played there, and I, I, I introduced him and stuff. Like that. Yeah, it, it, it was through there, and you know, I didn't get to get to EMI until 1974, right? Because um, I've been galvanising. That was a brilliant job. Um, <laughs> So <laughs> you mentioned Rack. You worked for Rack. Was that, yes, that I did. before it's EMI? A... No, 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 no. This, this right, was at, at EMI. I started at EMI in seventy four. How did you get into EMI then? Um, I was working. Job? I was working for a company um, uh, making bedspreads, quilts, and eider downs, oh. and uh, I was factory manager. Um, and uh, it, it was. Uh, talk about a li- life-changing thing. I managed 40 mature women. That was all that was there. They were made, and Jesus, they ran me ragged. Yeah, but but it was such good fun. And I learned so much and learned to deal with people th- through them. And it was a joy. And one of the girls in the office um, got the Guardian. And she said, hey, you like music, don't you? Um, EMI are looking for uh, junior sales reps. I was 24 at the time, so I wasn't a bloody junior. No, I said, <laughs> so I, I said, well, I'll give that a go. And I got the gig, which was really good. It's a um, sales but, rep that's going around shops. Sales rep? Yeah, selling, going around who shops. Can you, who were the first records you were selling, the first acts? Can you remember? Uh, um, Basically, your rollers. Right. Oh, right. Yeah. This is brilliant. Yeah. Basically, your rollers actually broke my heart because uh, uh, I. Um, I was selling, I think the album was called Strolling, and they were at the peak of their, uh, and I used to do lots of small shops, you know, the sort of bike shops that used to have a few records on the counter. Yes. But my big shop was Derek Guest in Bolton. And I went in, I, you know, we had targets that we had to meet. Yeah, and, yeah, the, yeah, albums yeah. and I went into Derek Guest's in Bolton, expecting him to order 750 copies. That's what you would I would have expected him to order. And he said, I'll have a box of 25. And I, I nearly fell through the floor because uh, if, if I'm not going to make my target. So I said, why? He said, I'm buying them from Spain. And that uh, kind of thing went cheaper. on from, oh, yeah, cheaper yeah. from Spain. Yeah, yeah. So I, I tried to talk around. I said, well, you know, Spain can't turn up tomorrow with a load no, 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 sure. no, loads cheaper. So that I remember very clearly um, trudging out of the shop thinking, feck, what's, am I going to make the target? <laughs> was, that, see, that was uh, uh, illuminating as well, because one of the other places I used to that turned me on to country music a little bit, I'm not a big country fan, but I used to go to Hull um, as part of my area, stay in, stay in Manchester Road, I think it was called. Uh, uh, and all at the time, I don't know what it is now, was a fishing port. Yeah, yeah. Um, tra- lots of trawlers. And on the trawlers, obviously, they couldn't have record players. It was the last vestige of eight tracks. <laughs> uh, so I used to, I was the star of the eight track in the, in the sales department because they used to buy loads of eight tracks in, in Hull and most of it country music. So that's, that kind of got me into country music. And, uh, and Hull was, you know, is a great place to go to. I don't know if it still is, but it's, but yeah. And I've actually got a, a good pal who's just arrived with me here from Hull, who I'll talk to you about later on, who, who, who you should have on this show. Um, but I'll talk to you about that later on. So, so how did you move from sales to promotion? Was it was it marketing? Hey, and promotions? 
No promotions. Promotions was uh, was the thing. Re- it, it was regional promotions to start right. off with, because because it was just at the time when the commercial stations. Yeah, absolutely. Started. They all yeah. had loads of commercial stations. And we moved over. And what, in, in usual EMI fashion, what happened was one day, oh yeah, we're uh, we're, we're rejigging the departments. We're splitting them down to EMI and and capital. It's be a separate operation. And I, you know, where's my job? Uh, you haven't got one at the moment. Uh, and I only did the sales thing for a year. Anyway, they came to my rescue and I finished up on the, EM, the EMI side as a, a, um, a regional. We had 32 people in the regional promotion department. That's unbelievable. 32. It was incredible. And I was one of them. And I ended up being um, the manager of the, uh, the regional. But we, we trimmed it a lot, down a lot by them. But I was mostly in the, um, in the north um, around... Uh, the Manchester scene. So you were turning up at, at Piccadilly Radio or Radio City in Liverpool yeah, yeah. or wherever, uh, and you, with your with the new forty five by who in your hot little hand, pilot or I don't know who. Uh, pilot was uh, pilot was the first one. Um, Magic uh, was the first one uh, that I remember from my very first. That would have been. Uh, EMI sales conference because right. I joined uh, we had a, a sales conference in Glen Eagles oh. within about six weeks of me actually joining the company and um, Pilot played and Labby Sifri and Big Jim Sullivan <laughs> and brilliant I sat it was at Glen Eagles I sat on the floor talking to Big Jim Sullivan very early in the morning both of us a bit merry yeah. uh, just about shit and, and it was fantastic one, one thing I majorly remember from that gig some idiot we had a, a, a marquee out and all the guys Labby Sifri I think performed to us all the guys were sat on, on straw bales hay bales rather than that. and somebody set light to one of them and right. a kid had to be taken to hospital because he had burns. <laughs> this is an EMI Surely conference. this is what you expect from a sales conference. Isn't it? Somebody always sets light or something, didn't they? <laughs> well, well, it's what we got, that's for sure. And, and the sales conferences were a real eye opener. But that was, you know, and I, I had, and stop me if I'm going on. Um, uh, they had a raffle at that sales conference. Uh, the, the managing director there was a guy called Bob Mercer. Oh, yeah. Well, that's no, no longer with us. And I had a raffle, and the, the winner won a salmon. So, <laughs> that's pretty. Just, whoever gave, and this is all the EMI sales reps, that, whoever gave me the salmon said, Oh, take it around and show it to people. And I, I did, because I, you know, I was new. I took it around and I got to Bob Mercer's table. He said, Sit down, you look a twat. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, "Oh, then you can have." So you must have, you must have got you uh, you know your sales rep and then and then promotion man. Yep. You must have got used to humiliation on a daily on a daily basis. You're turning up with a record. I mean, tell people what it's like in those days. Certainly, to play a radio, you know, to trying to get the program director of the radio to listen to yeah. pilots or whatever, yeah. and then whether he liked it. Did they even get through the whole record, or did they take it off halfway? How did you find it? Oh no, they'd, they'd only play a few few bars. That's the way. That's the way it worked. <laughs> so you wouldn't get <laughs> to meet like... them. You could actually sit there. Oh with yeah, yeah, them yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, no, that's interesting. That was the that was the trick of of being a good. Because to get to people, yeah. Um, so if you get to meet people, I know obviously you know there's the whole thing about taking people out for drink. If you get on with them, you know meals, whatever. If you have a, uh, if you have one of the turns comes and you, you take them out and they can meet the band. Well, in All the early eighties, it got into major kind of procedures, didn't it? With kind of gimmicks and free gifts and you know uh, the the oh, ZZ yeah, well, Top single that famously was it called Chicken Dinner? I can't remember. Somebody hired a crane. And delivered chicken dinners to each of the windows at, to Portland. Oh, well, that was yeah. uh, that was Radio that, One, yeah. Radio that One. That sounds like right. that sounds like uh, Richard Richard Evans and Oliver Smallman to me. Uh, yeah, but uh, no. Did you get yeah, involved no, in that kind of caper? Of course, I loved it. Give us some examples know. of that. Um, well, uh, I'm trying to think of one where we no, I just t- get people to meet people. That's all. That's all yeah. we used to do. I, I, I'm struggling to find the one because uh, up, up, we didn't get that many um, uh, artists because we were we were regional, so we weren't yeah. that important. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but um, we did have obviously we had Queen at the time, so it, for me, Queen helped help me 
introduce myself because I would take them to the free trade hall where the gig, I can remember a big gig. And I got to go to, uh, the. it was Freddie Mercury's birthday when they played the, the free trade hall in Manchester. This was the, the Red and Green Lights tour. Um, yeah. Know what and they had a party afterwards. They had a couple of radio people with me. Um, everybody was quite giddy. And Fred, uh, Mel Bush was the promoter. Uh, Mel yeah. Bush gave him a big cake. And as Freddie took it, it fell off. And, he, and Fred started throwing cake around. And one piece, big piece hit me. So I wiped it off the face and threw it back at Fred. So two days later, I'm stood in the manager director's office at EMI Manchester Square. A uh, letter from um, from Jim Beach and Freddie Mercury. This guy must be sacked. And uh, I explained what went on, and I survived, and, and thankfully became friends with Jim Beach. But that was that was in Manchester, and that was the kind of thing that we did to entertain the people we were trying to get to. And See, I, I always imagine that Queen after show parties consisted of people like Freddie Mercury throwing cake. And I'm so pleased, aren't you, Dave, that it's true. <laughs> That's just, it's a relief, really. Yeah, you'd be cross if you found out they'd really gone back to their um, their dressing well, room and meditated, wouldn't you, yeah. really? Yeah. Well, Ever, Ever, Everett, uh, Kenny's, Kenny had some wonderful party stories. He, he, knew, he knew Freddie very well, and I got quite friendly with Everett. And, uh, I, you know, I used to know exactly what went on. Um, you know, the, the stories with people with um, cups on their head full of cocaine. Um, the uh, midget people walking around with they cups. They did, didn't they? Yeah. Yes, they did. I, and Everett says they were true. Final tap, isn't it? Yeah. That, that yeah. happened. That happened. Yeah, so when did, you, when did you come to London? I uh, came to London um, probably 77. Right. Um, no, it wasn't. No, it was earlier than that. Yeah, 75 when I came to London. And the first thing I ever remember, were, I worked at a band called Straps. Um, yes, exactly. On Harvest, I seem to remember. Straps. Oh, okay. uh, the drummer you may know, a guy called Mick Underwood. Uh, oh, I know that was, name, yes. Yeah, yes. who was in, um, was he in The Pretty Things? No, he wasn't in The Pretty Things. Anyway, my first job was to go down the, um, what's the, what's the fashion road called down there? Um, Savile Row or... Savile yeah, Row, yeah. Right. Not Savile Row, but Bond the funky Street. place. Yeah, Bond Street. Bond Street. Yeah, Bond Street. Yeah, Bond Street. Yeah. One of those, with the strap single, talking to the people in the shops, um, to get them just to play it in the shops. I think they were kind of priming me to see what I could do. This uh, is, and I, I think you would be... You would be so they they tried to see how much humiliation you could deal with. That's basically what they were doing, weren't they? Well, they, they, they were, and it worked. Uh, but, but not long after that, um, Kate was around, because I, I got to know Kate Bush a little bit um, about two years before she put a record out. Oh, really? Um, yeah, because it was, it was a, a, a very she organic... She was signed at the age of 16, wasn't she? Via yeah. David Gilmour, is that right? That's right. Yeah. It was two well, years David... of her planning the campaign, that's it. Yeah, David Gilmour brought two acts to uh, EMI. Uh, one was a band called Unicorn, who were very, very good. Um, had a, quite a few albums out and I, I kind of still going in a way uh, and Kate Bush and David I remember thought that Unicorn would be the one that would make it and Kate Bush um, would be uh, would be okay it would be good but Kate immediately I mean she was something special um, nice bunch of people lovely family got to meet mum and dad Dr. Dr. Bush and the uh, two brothers and uh, it was Really, really nice. And in fact, funnily enough, this week you will remember John Pigeon, a journalist. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, it, it John died about three three years ago, I think. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. it was his birthday this week. And I remember one of the first interviews I did was taking John Pigeon to talk to Kate Bush um, down at the, at the farm where she was. And the f and the very first interview I did with Kate Bush was at the biscuit factory united biscuits and i thought i thought <laughs> well, on, the radio, a, on the radio uh, on the radio on the radio the very first thing with dale winton wow, wow. that's top at united top. biscuits that's well, yeah, incredible there were the loads of djs used to start yeah. at the united biscuits network didn't they because yeah, they, they, they it was a way to get into radio i, I had people yeah. like uh, tony blackburn didn't but loads of other people did loads of other people yeah yeah yeah, yeah. 
And, uh, and I, I, re I remember thinking, uh, you know, <laughs> which is unusual for me, but I thought I'll take Kate somewhere that's, uh, you know, just to get her used to being interviewed. Yes. And De Dale, yeah. was, you know, Dale was always lovely. And, um, you know, uh, and it worked. You know, she enjoyed well, it. Does a tape of that exist? Wouldn't that be lovely to hear? It would be lovely to hear, wouldn't it? It would be lovely to hear. So, <laughs> but, but it went on from there. Well, Kate was a, a kind of major player for me. And Kate, you know, uh, it was one of the things that I think I was involved most in, in making happen, but only because um, Kenny Everett, uh, um, a guy called Tony Myatt, and a producer guy, a really good friend of mine called Eddie Puma yeah, at yeah. Capital Radio, yeah. they, cha they championed it. Uh, they, it, 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 I can't really remember. Somebody reminded me the other week, which wasn't exactly the way I thought it went. But I, it was due to be released, and then the release was held. But I'd already given it to um, to Everett to listen to, and he started to play it, and that's it came out of there. It, right, it, it really did. So that's so you, you know, really did play a part in it. That's amazing. Well, yeah, you've got to facilitate things. Yeah. Going on. So you were, you're working for EMI, and EMI had really wide range of acts didn't they i mean you must have yeah you must have dealt with all of them in one way or another must you over yeah. the years you were there for quite a while give us a, i mean give us give us a flavor people like cliff richard ever do you deal with cliff i dealt with cliff for 25 years <laughs> exactly. go on wow. go on tell wow. us something surprising about cliff richard well cliff's still alive so yeah, of course. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, i do say but I can remember being in Newcastle. Uh, I don't know what we were doing. It wasn't the tube, I don't think, with Cliff. And I actually played tennis with him. Right. And, uh, right. Played tennis with him. And the story was at the time that Cliff had a colostomy bag. Right. It was hot gossip. That was the well, rumour, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. So I played tennis with Cliff and I went in the shower with him afterwards. We were in the communal shower and I'm – not trying to look at his willy, but I'm trying to check whether he's got a colostomy bag, and he di and he didn't. I should, I was I was naked with Cliff Richard. You heard it here first. <laughs> there you go. And That's another did. major scoop, Dave. <laughs> very. I, I, no, Cliff. Cliff was really nice, and um, early on, uh, he got new management towards the end of my time with EMI, who who were. Nah, just turned his head a little bit, and right. it, it was as much fun as it as it was before. They had a, a, I worked with a guy called David Bryce, uh, who was managing Cliff for, for a time. He's, I think he, no, he was personal assistant, um, uh, but he was really good with Cliff, and I got on well with uh, uh, with David. And in fact, in my place here, I have two Tannoy uh, little red monitors. And David used to come in and listen to the demos of Cliff's stuff in my office because I had these little red monitors that I'd got from Abbey Road. All and right. he said, best speakers in the building. And I've still got them. They're still here. Um, but, yeah, no, Cliff was good. I did a lot of things, went to a lot of places with Cliff. And, uh, you know, uh, he, was, he was good, really good fun. And, you know, the only reason my mum could figure out whether my job was any good was – that I got a Christmas card from Cliff Richard every there year. There you go. Oh. So, so, what your these things was. matter. Yeah. Yeah, matter. yeah, it was. Well, she, you know, she said, oh, well, you know, it must be it's quite important. Cliff Richard sent him a card. So who of all the all the acts that you dealt with uh, were, the, were the ones that you had? He obviously had a good relationship with Kate Bush. Uh, who, yeah. else? who else? Who else? Um, all the blur, obviously, towards right. the, the end of my time. I, 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 I it's the, that lovely thing when you start off with somebody that's just started, hasn't really done anything, yeah. and you grow with them, and it, and to see where they get. And Damon Albarn is a, a genius, and he, his work ethic is fantastic. And what, and it always was right from sort of day one when they were bloody idiots. And, you know, they used to call me the Popeye Doyle of promotion because <laughs> I was forever lecturing them that they didn't need to take drugs to be creative. Yeah. Uh, and, 
I've actually got that written on the. Uh, I've got the blur one of the Blur um, albums posters up on my wall. Uh, Modern life is rubbish. Yeah, uh, and on, and on the back of it, Alex has written to the Popeye Doyle of promotion. Oh, that's um, but the, yeah, the Blur uh, talk talk. I absolutely adored Mark Hollis. They were they were difficult. Um, but yeah, so was, many, yeah, and I must say, just talk about that for a second because that's quite interesting, isn't it? Because there's more than just musical talent, isn't it? Whereas yeah. Blur had some kind of get up and go about them, didn't they? And dealt with the outside world. Talk, talk, yeah. less so. Talk, talk, not self promotional at all. In fact, I think Mark, Mark. Hollis was, uh, was kind of reclusive, actually, wasn't he? Yeah, he was. And he difficult. Was. He would only do it once they ended uh, interviews on the phone and from a phone booth in some. Didn't he live out yeah. in the it's somewhere in the heart? He, he li- yeah, he lived out in um, in Suffolk, not far from Peel, actually. Oh right, um, Stone Market, yeah, uh, Stone Market that way on, yeah. And he, he had a he had a big plot, but he only he let most of it run wild, uh, and he just said he kept a bit. But he it was a tell you a story, another story. Mark Hollis, lovely story. I wasn't with him. Um, Steve Hayes, who did TV with me, was with him. At, at Stowe Market, and they were in a pub, and there was a sign behind the... And Mark had quite long hair. Uh, There's a sign behind the bar, no skinheads in this pub. And Steve, is, they're having a drink, and Mark disappeared for a few minutes, came back, he'd gone to the barbers, had all his hair uh, taken off, and was a skinhead. And uh, I, I got, got the pub managers to throw him out just so he could get thrown out of a pub just so he get thrown out of a pub this is a bizarre logic isn't it <laughs> but his music his music is sensational no so yeah uh, Mark, Mark's Mark's a big miss because so were, you, what he were done, you, so. you this is marketing or promotion were you involved in marketing went, at the stage I was uh, uh, so does that mean that you're sitting there at a meeting that says how you know what what kind of I don't know gimmicks or what images or whatever what, that you're specifically yeah, yeah, well, you can, to sell someone yeah you talk you talk about um uh, my, one of my Bernie Marsden is always a favorite Bernie yeah. mentioned me in his biography um he had a solo uh, album out, Bernie. Bernie, st- I still, I'm still in touch with Bernie. Lovely, lovely, great player, lovely man. And um, that was one of my first marketing jobs. And he wanted to call the album "Look at Me Now," you know, sort of uh, big up himself. So I came up with the idea of an optician's chart. L look at me oh, yeah, now. Yeah. Just spread up. Um, Bernie to this day thinks it's absolutely hilarious. We had T-shirts made and did the whole thing, and but you know people were calling the album Eluk, Eluk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you, yeah, that kind of crap, you know. That did you did you do a lot of uh, do you taking acts round? I'm thinking of Saturday morning kids shows were a big thing in the yeah in the eighties, yeah. weren't they? They yeah, were that stuff. I mean, yes, they were. And I was there for, I mean, and bloody Christmas Day, let me tell you, when, you know, Noel Edmonds is there in a hospital, you know, Malk's been up from four o'clock in the flippy morning getting somebody prepared to go and be, do oh, a guest spot on Christmas oh, Day. Oh, really? They were actually oh, really? going, yeah. doing it live oh, on Christmas yeah. Day. My that's amazing. Goodness. Yeah, it is. It's, because it's, that's how hard it was to get a record played or exposed. Well, the, competi- the competition was, was fierce. Yeah. I mean, and it's funny because... Um, jumping ahead to when I moved down here, and there are reasons why I moved down here. Um, I was astounded in the first weeks that I moved here because I would go into places here, uh, the radio stations. They were not as open. They, they were America focused, yeah. and it's. Uh, and I can remember taking a Tina Turner tracking. I think it was typical male, and the guy um, I, I saw. Um, said, oh no, he said, uh, we, we, we've already got a black female singer on the, on the playlist and we'll be playing that for six weeks. So we're not, we won't look at this for another six weeks. And I'm stood there going, what? It's <laughs> Tina Turner. You know, <laughs> oh, no, we, we can't, we, we've researched it and everybody likes yeah, what we're would. playing. It's like, you have got to be fucking kidding. Because <laughs> the other one, when I moved down here, I need, I need to mention Crowded House because they're fundamentally... Yeah, go on. Yeah, yeah. Right, yes. Being here. I uh, started to work with uh, with Crowded House when... Um, I can't remember whether I was marketed or not, but I, I first met Crowded House when they were called the Malays right, yeah, in, yeah. in Los Angeles. 
and they were staying, believe it or not, in a crowded house. So right. that that's how where the name came, came yeah. about. And from then on, um, I, I got quite close with the crowdies, and, and um, well, you and I came down for the one of the farewell, one yeah, of the yeah. many farewell concerts. Yeah, it was many farewell. But um, they were instrumental in, in introducing me more to Australia. I came down a couple of times with them. Uh, I came down when they were recording um, uh, uh, the album uh, on Carry Carry Beach. Together Alone, yes. Yeah, and the, um, I, walked in, um, I walked in on them when they were actually recording a, a song called Pineapple Head. And this, they'd rented two houses. One was used as a studio, one was used to live in. And I got down there and I'd actually been brought somebody from Wogan down to see another act in, in, uh, in Melbourne, which was quite successful. But I, I, as I was here, I thought, bugger it, I'm not, I'm not going back without visiting the, the Crowdies. So I went over there and walked in on um, uh, uh, the recording uh, Pineapple Head. Uh, Paul Hester in the toilets of this place because that was the acoustic was good there playing the drums and just hung around whilst they played the song and then uh, we stayed over just one night overnight with them um, but um, that that was magical because Paul in that afternoon he said I've gone to the video shop do you want to hear the album so far and he, we drove. 20 case to the, to the video shop and he played me what they'd done on the, off, so far on the album off a cassette and, and, and that was absolutely magical and it's meant jumping further forward when I was seriously considering coming to Australia I didn't know how I was going to do it but in 98 I came down here um, and Neil I toured with Neil Finn he was doing a solo tour and um, yeah, it's in a solo tour with this album, Try Whistling right. This. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, I saw the parts of Australia I hadn't seen. I came down, I took a, took a month's holiday, and I thought, I, I need to have a good look at this because I'm bringing my family, family down here. I need, to, I need to make sure it works. Uh, so I saw, uh, went round, quite a way around Australia. Uh, and at the time, Elroy, uh, who is now the drummer in Crowded House, was about eight years old. Uh, and he was on the tour and of course we got on like house on fire because you know I, I, i'm very childish and it was really really cool uh and that's what made my mind up um that, uh, that australia was for me so after that i decided to look around and see how i could get down here and the lovely thing that happened was on that album is that elroy when he was eight painted me a picture of, of the album oh that's and lovely on the, and on the back to Malcolm, thanks for a great time on the road. You rock. Love Elroy. <laughs> and he was eight years old at the time. Eight years old. That's, That's cool, sweet. That? That's, That's really so cool. good. And, you know, uh, uh, and the crowdies were kind of instrumental in helping me get down here. And, you know, and, uh, and I still see them. I'm still in touch um, uh, with Nick Seymour, bass player. Right. Uh, Nick, Nick is a good friend. Um, but they're, they're, they're instrumental in me being in Australia and introduced me to Australia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What else? Have you got any other souvenirs there to show us? Anything else you've put by? Oh. Well, it, uh, when we were, I don't know if we were going back. But that was a, another album oh, that, of course. Yes. that led me into a million things. Now, do you know so the, was... de the deliberate mistake on that, on that album cover is that more than one of the people on the album cover is not on the He's album? not on the record. <laughs> Uh, yeah, there you yeah, go. Yeah, Ian Anderson, the tall guy with the with the glasses at the front, was booted <laughs> off because there was another Ian Anderson <laughs> in Ireland at the time. All very complicated. Very good. I, I yeah. particularly like this because one of the acts I got to work with that I loved working with was the Pet Shop Boys. Oh, of course. Um, and uh, I have a copy of this. Oh, the Dairy Book of Home oh, Management. That's so nice. Oh, Has that oh, got fantastic. Well, it was Neil. Which Has is. He got don't tell me it's he, signed uh, by Neil. It is. Oh, uh, <laughs> what did he say? That's so great. He, he was. He edited it, didn't he? Yes, he, he did. did. He did. He was Steve, the editor. Steve Bush designed it, I think. Yeah. 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 And it, it, it's it's here. Uh, you, you probably can't read it, but it, it I'll says. I'll read it out. Go on. To Malcolm, this was the worst job I ever had. <laughs> <laughs> oh. The old tenant. And well, from it, there, we 
from there we got to this with Neil. <laughs> oh my goodness! Whoa! What's I that? I won't dare well, inquire. Go on, <laughs> go on. Go just on. Is, fill us well, in. It, it's 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 a it, before is uh, uh, it was the, uh, the the project, and this is what I didn't I didn't have to take this to radio. Thank goodness, so but it's out there. Yes, so, was that yeah. where, that's a, that's a Pet Shop Boys record. Yes, it is. It's uh, yes, it is. It's it, it's um. It's I have a, never even heard of that. I How many know. copies were pressed? The remixes. Oh, I, I don't think it was that. Um, probably. I don't. I wouldn't like to say. Are those just not, promotional copies? Yes. These. Yeah. Are, yeah. <laughs> so I don't, I, That's hilarious. Uh, but I, I kept those because it sort of. It, I thought it balanced quite well with the. No, absolutely. Oh, absolutely. Oh, that's no, that brilliant. Good. That's uh, brilliant. Oh, yeah, no, I've got a million things. Um, I love the idea that Neil did all those things. He's never been. This guy's no, pretty no, good. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> he, this guy's pretty good, David Hepworth. Do you know yeah, him? Thank you, thank you. That's very uh, uh, another great guy. Oh, yes, yeah, Sound of the City. Yes, yes. yes. So, Charlie Gillick, what a lovely man. I, yes. I, I have. I've got a two-hour recording of him with dr john um which i i, I still listen to quite often a, right a gen- did you work with you must have worked with dr john dr john dr. was signed to EMI, yes he was, was in the late he was he was absolutely wonderful was he really and such great fun absolutely and very very together very very funny i went for a curry with him in kilburn me and dr john i mean a curry in Kilburn, it's just like wow. <laughs> talk about talk about magic life. You know, <laughs> I tell you, like, I tell you, what I was thinking the other day. I was I read the other day about you know when you think of the, the glory days of the record business and they think about things that wouldn't happen anymore. And I don't know when this was. And it must be in the nineties. Bonnie Raitt, who was on EMI, was supporting <coughs> Eric Clapton at, at I think Earl's Court. Yeah. And I was doing a radio show on GLR on Friday, and Friday evenings. Yeah, I remember you doing that. Okay. And and I, I said, do you, do you get Bonnie Raitt to come in? And Malcolm said, yeah, I can do this. And so Bonnie Raitt did her support slot at Earl's Court, and then Malcolm drove her over to Marilyn, Marilyn High Street. Uh-huh. She did my show live for about half an hour and then went back and did the encores with Derek Clapton. That's fantastic. And you think to yourself, nobody, nobody yeah. would do that for anything other than kind of uh, Graham Norton. You know what I mean? Yeah. They wouldn't. Yeah, not yeah. in a million yeah, years. Yeah. And they'd also be tense about being stuck in traffic or oh, there'd be something. Whatever. I mean, there'd be anxiety. Whereas the yeah. idea you'd do it for a little Tim Port radio show because... Yeah. Because she'd enjoy it, and you know, and she did enjoy it, and she was yeah, great, and, and it, so forth. Yeah. You know, um, uh, oh, she was, loves she loves the music. Absolutely. I've, I've, can I jump in because Go I've on. got a, a similar story connected with the whistle test? Go on. Uh, Go on. She she was doing um, the whistle test. Mark Cooper was uh, was producing it. Oh, later, uh, you mean later? She later. later with Jules. Yeah, yeah, yeah right. Yeah, later, yeah, yeah. Sorry, later with Jules. I mixed up. Um, and. Um, yeah, you know, I, I I loved hanging out with Bonnie. She's f- fabulous. She's just about to go on the road again in in the states, and um, Eric Clapton wanted to come to the show. To, to to and you know Bonnie said, "Can you get him in?" I said, "Well, it's Eric Clapton. I'll, I'll, it'll be a struggle, but you know, I got him <laughs> in." But the funny thing was, of course, Mark Cooper seeing that Eric Clapton was there, was desperate to get him on the programme, and Eric did not want to do anything. Man, he just man, wanted to man. sit in the dressing room and chat with Bonnie. And Mark Cooper was going mental. And I thought it was hilarious. I tried, obviously, I tried to so look, you know, just go up and, and have a chat with Jules or something, but no, he wouldn't, he wouldn't do anything. Man. So it's like, she him. was there, he wasn't. No, it was cool. Very, yeah, very cool. Yeah. No, Bonnie was lovely. So listen, uh, Malcolm, it's been lovely talking to you. But the way we traditionally finish these conversations is asking yeah. people to tell us what is the greatest record ever made? Do you have an answer to that question? Well, yeah, I, I, I do. and But it'll be, um, it'll be different next week. Oh, um, it's the same for all of us. But at the moment, uh, I think I have to... It, it would normally be Todd Rundgren, let me be honest with you. All right. Okay, good. Well, because I've got this here and I haven't shown it to you yet. Oh, what? Really? I had... that's, that's, that's brilliant. That's the greatest record. That's a challenging record for the greatest <laughs> record ever made. 
Yeah, but it was it, it, it turned me on to so much. Yeah, and being a promotion guy, I, I slightly regret it now because it wasn't my job to get things autographs and stuff like that. I, I, and, and can you imagine doing selfies with, with Frank Zappa? I mean, you'd be dead. Um, but we had he, he had an album called Thing Fish, which wasn't that great. Uh, and we had dinner with him in Julie's, Julie's restaurant oh, right. down in, yeah, uh, I know. in Notting, Notting, Hill. Yeah. Yeah. Notting Hill Gate. And in the back room there, nice big room. Yeah, yeah. Ten of us. And he took on the, um, uh, the sommelier role. And basically turned down every bottle of red they brought. They bought him, but he doesn't and drink. He did. didn't drink, did he, Frank? <laughs> well, it, it, well, he made a very good show of it then, because we, we, I remember taking home three bottles of red that we had to buy that he didn't wouldn't drink, but he was tasting them for sure. So he was he. How interesting! But oh. but on the rare occasion, I thought I'm I'm going to sit with. I saw Frank Zappa first time Free Trade Hall Manchester 1967 with my sister who was a trombone player. She turned me on to Frank Zappa. And it was awesome. And I saw him quite a lot after that. But, and the chance to meet Frank Zappa was beyond fantastic for me. So I thought, bugger it, I'm going to take my album, which my sister still says is her album. I'll take my album, I'm going to get Frank to sign it. And I, I just, I said, I don't do this very often, Frank, but would you mind, you know, I've had this since 1967 and it's, I play it a lot. And, it's, and he, he, he got it out and he, Pull the record out. Check the uh, check the matrix number. Yeah, looks okay. Uh, put it back in. Made a big, real big fuss about this. Put it back in the sleeve, and then signed it on the back. Uh, oh, right. lovely! Okay. That's go. gorgeous. That's eighty four. Yeah. Uh, so today, that's my my favorite album, and I still love it. Very, very good. And what a sleeve. It, and what, a, what a sleeve. It Absolutely. is so great. It's quite reminiscent of another, another kind of album, isn't it, really? Yes. It yeah. is. Word in your attic. A Zoom with a view.